Good afternoon. Thank you for the welcome and the opportunity to be here. And I, you were definitely sitting in the room at that presentation. And I'm just trying to remember if you were one of the ones who was dozing off or not. I think you were really paying attention. Um, if you were dozing, it was my fault for not making it interesting enough. Um, I'm delighted to be here um, and uh, uh, ran into a little traffic on the way down from Cleveland, unfortunately. There's, is there some construction going on in the interstates? Of course. How unusual that is uh, in Ohio. Um, I am a chairman of the board of Cleveland Right to Life. I'm a retired, recently retired uh, medical device company CEO and have been involved with my wife, Donna, and uh, our nine children. Our eighth child is right here, Michael, get helping me with my PowerPoint this morning. Um, we've been involved in the, in the pro-life movement in, in Greater Cleveland for quite a long time. Um, I mean, almost to the beginning. Uh, and uh, more recently, in the last five or six years, have gotten very involved with the uh, Cleveland organization. And Molly Smith, the name many of you know, who is now in Australia as we speak. And we help each other out and go around the state of Ohio uh, talking to pro-life groups, um, we're very close to Paula, certainly, and it's great to, great to see her here again uh, and her organization. And what this presentation is about, and correctly, I have adapted a little bit uh, to, to this organization, but I give this presentation to various groups, not just pro-life groups, but particularly to younger groups, because there's a lot of confusion about language in, in what we do and in our movement. You know, conservatives, liberals, Tea Party. There's all kinds of titles and things, progressives and so on. And and I and I put this together to try to make some sense out of that. Number one, and number two, to really educate, and train uh, our our people in the pro life movement to to be as educated and uh, conversive in the issues, and to also know who are we up against because this is a movement, and movements are usually against some other type of movement or some other scenario that is uh, contradictory to their core beliefs. And so that's really what this is about. So we're really not here to, uh, pre Mike, go ahead. We're, we're not here, I'm not here to preach the converted. You guys are all pro-life and you're, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're ground uh, in, in, in the right um, philosophies of life. We're really here to train um, the troops because we are troops. And I make this point in the, at the symposium. We had 1,200 people this past March, first week of March, at the symposium in Cleveland. And we look at that opportunity as a chance to train our troops who are going to go out and proselytize the cause of pro-life and family. And, and that really is our, our goal. I mean, our goal is life and family. The two are inexorably <laughs> tied to one another. I think you would probably agree with me. So getting into the lexicon and, and the words that we, we kind of um, uh, talk about is, is liberalism. Um, and I'm not, I'm not one of those extreme people, you know, Rush Limbaugh refers to liberalism as a <laughs> mental disorder. Rush Limbaugh. Um, and, you know, there perhaps is, is something to that, but I'm, I don't want to get into that, that extreme look at it here. But what I wanted to explain is a little bit about where, where this all came from and how we got to where we are, because to know and understand who's on the other side that we're fighting against in our cause, we need to know as much about them and how they got there as possible. Right, amen. So liberalism, when it started, was actually something that we would probably all in this room agree with. There were, there were, it was a completely different situation. It's a political philosophy based on limited government and individual freedom. Sounds like a conservative today. It started with the Glorious Revolution a long time ago in 1688 in England, was buttressed by the Declaration of Independence, and of course the French Revolution and the French philosophy had a lot of influence on, on certainly on American uh, views on liberalism and certainly more into the future in progressivism. The, the focus can't see, make sure I'm up to put one more mic. Okay. So the focus in historical liberalism was on freedom, equal rights, consent of the governed, democracy, life, liberty, and property, which was which was the, the, the French mantra, balanced budgets, fiscal responsibilities, free trade, meaning hands off of trade, laissez faire, economics, and individualism. Even Adam Smith, 
who was uh, the, the father of, of um, free mar the free market philosophy today, that we see today. Um, he was a liberal in the sense that he, he really espoused the view in all of his writings and all of his work that, that the government interference in the economy should be, was not productive and should be limited to, to the extent uh, possible here. And the last part of classical liberalism is that it would protect citizens from monarchs, despots, and dictators. Okay? So far, none of us would disagree very much with most of what was classical liberalism. So how did that morph into modern liberalism? One more Thanks. Uh, in the mid-1800s in England, government intervention and involvement in things, or what we might call the early stages of statism, uh, began to be accepted slowly by the public uh, on trade matters. And there's some re good reasons why government should be involved in trade. You know, we have interstate oh, commerce right. issues and so Limited. on. Import and export laws. So, you know, uh, there's some good reasons to have government involved in trade. Factory work reforms, uh, working conditions, child labor, those kinds of things. There were a lot of abuses of those, you know, in the Industrial Revolution and since then. And, and so a lot of government intervention was called for by the people to intervene and in, 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 in improve those situations. And intervention on behalf of the poor, certainly. Um, a lot of these same issues transferred to the U.S. as well. Uh, one of those was the disparity that many found unacceptable between haves and have-nots. We still see that today, Absolutely. and we still hear a lot today about, uh, you know, envy politics and the haves and the have-nots, and, you know, everybody's, both parties in our country are fighting for uh, the middle class uh, and, and what they have to offer to the middle class. The Gilded Age, at the turn of the century, uh, if you've ever seen that great documentary on, on, uh, on the, the Gilded Age on, um, on the History Channel, back in talking about the Rockefeller days and, and, uh, uh, and others, where the disparity between the haves and have-nots was phenomenal in right. this country. Yes, sir. Uh, it was absolutely yes, sir. phenomenal. Sure was. Uh, and it was what many have called unbridled capitalism. Absolutely. Many factions uh, hungry for the government to step in and do something. And again, not entirely without some rationale. Okay, there were a lot of ills that needed to get fixed, and a lot of people looked to the federal government to do that. So the result was what we see today, and what has developed over the years is, is progressivism. So you've gone from, from traditional classical liberalism, which was closer to what we see today as conservative views about things, to progressivism, which was a, an American um, sort of a twist on um, on, on some of the good points about classical liberalism. Woodrow Wilson and Teddy Roosevelt. Wilson felt, and this is an important quote, Wilson felt that there were no principled limits to what the government may do. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. Woodrow Wilson was president a long time ago. He was president during World War I. Okay? He started the League of Nations. Um, but his philosophy was, I don't see any reason why the government can't step in and do just about everything. Uh oh Okay? That's basically what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the people in, in his time frame also believe that the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, our founding documents, needed to evolve over time. So they were not what we would call strict, strict constructionists mm -hmm. in viewing the Constitution as a document that may need some interpretation as time goes on, but it doesn't change with, with social mores, etc. Modern liberals um, um, eventually rejected progressivism because it actually embraced many of the values, uh, traditional values and morals, but they take their cues, certainly, from progressivism. Mm -hmm. So modern liberalism, progressivism, or modern liberalism is really uh, uh, progressivism on, uh, on steroids. No uh, it's very different from the classical. It's an amalgamation of a bunch of things. Progressivism, socialism, fascism, statism, enlightenment from France, anti-theism. And it's an important one to note here, and we'll talk about this in a minute, is it's not uh, atheism. <coughs> it's one thing if you don't believe in God. I'm not going to force you to it. I'm not going to require you to do it. I'm still going to like you as a person. Okay? Anti-theism, which we're seeing a great deal of today, 
are, 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 are groups and individuals in a philosophy that actively works against religions. Okay? Right. We, against those who wish to believe in God and practice their faith uh, as appropriate. Yeah, that's, a that's a very different distinction, and please, please keep that in mind. Okay, the uh, great quote from the Heritage Foundation here. Um, the contemporary understanding of liberalism is based not on individual liberty, liberty like the classical was, but on the use of government to grant benefits and advantages in order to give everyone the ability to achieve a certain standard of living and reduce inequalities. Now, at first glance, you might read that and say, what's the problem? Okay, everybody should have an open opportunity to achieve whatever they wish to achieve. The problem is, is who's going to secure that result? The individual or the state? Right. And that's where we have where we have the issues, certainly. Well put. Modern liberalism is a rejection, clearly and plainly, of American constitutionalism, and it's an embrace of a new concept concept of freedom anchored in big government. God help us. So, Teddy Roosevelt, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and um, LBJ does not stand for LeBron James. Uh, for, for those of the younger people in the room, it was Lyndon Baines Johnson, the president who succeeded uh, President Kennedy. Right. Uh, they really turned the corner in, in cementing programs that really focused on what is today progressivism. They really locked things in, progressivism, liberalism. Um, and things like trust busting, which was actually had many great positive aspects to it. Response in the Depression. A lot of these social programs that we still see today in place came about during the Depression. It's sort of like when we just had the recent 2009 massive recession. Some say actually uh, the former Federal Reserve Chairman recently made a statement in the talk that this was actually worse than the Depression was in 29 in terms of its long-lasting effect. We'll, we'll let you decide. Um, but it brings about certain things, things, the solutions to some of those massive problems like the Depression or like um, uh, any kind of crisis is more government involvement, but they tend to step in to solve a problem. They tend to never step out. Right. Okay? They become, uh, they become uh, permanent uh, fixtures in the, in the program. Um, and so modern liberalism encourages and gets life from an extensive network of interest groups organized to get new rights and to preserve benefits. Mike, I think you're, uh, yeah, keep going. There we go. Okay. Great. So this is just an illustration of, of, of how some things have turned around here. You know, there was a time as we said, that classical liberalism was, was a very positive thing, focused on rights, individual liberties, and property, and so on, and, and the, the right wing, the, the despots, uh, uh, the dictators, uh, fascism, Nazism, and so on, were, were viewed as, as controlling and obviously opposite of classical liberalism. And, and things have turned around quite a bit, and that's why I like to spend time talking about the sort of the definitions here, can we? Um, I'll say this, you can agree or disagree, you tell me from your own reading of what's going on today. Okay. Liberals, progressives, have begun to act like fascists. Hmm. Yes or no? Let's see. Yes. Elites yes. making decisions for everybody, right. telling us what we should eat, yes. what we should drink, when we should do it, where we should do it, etc. Society takes precedence over the individual. Societal rights versus individual rights, and I'm not talking about the rights to keep you from killing somebody or committing a, a, a heinous crime. It's, look, your individual beliefs are subservient to what the beliefs of the whole society, or the, as the state determines it. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. The state becomes the God. No kidding. Along with an anti-theism and an atheism pervasive uh, in, in, the, in, the, in typical state uh, environments, um, the state becomes the God. Yes. An intolerance of opposing views. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes. You, it, as I'm sure many of you in this room have, have had the circumstance where, you know, <laughs> it's not okay just to have your opinion. Okay? Absolutely. The other side right. wants to beat you up for having that opinion. That's right. Or to suppress your ability to, ex express, to express yourself. 
Um, suspension of constitutional provisions. Well, what do I mean by that? Our Constitution is in place. Well, look at the current situation today with the Constitution, which includes what are the rights of Congress, what are they supposed to be doing, and what is the executive branch doing? And this is being litigated as we speak, okay? <laughs> that through executive actions, the president and his party believe that they can take things, take responsibility for doing things that are really vested constitutionally in the Congress. Congress is allowing its powers to be usurped. Absolutely. Okay? Yeah, that's going to have, that's going to have Supreme Court implications uh, for sure. Um, there are no absolute truths. Oh my God, okay? scary. Truth is what you want it to be today, scary. which is why they can't accept religion. Right. Or the power of religion, because religion, we as, as, as Christians or as Jews, we believe in, in certain principles based on truth. Uh, they can't tolerate that, because truth is whatever is convenient for the state to define as truth today or tomorrow. And using the media as right. propaganda. For those of you who have ever studied, or for those of you of a different age who uh, remember more about World War II, um, you know, one of, the, one of the vehicles that the Nazi regime uh, made great use of was the Ministry of Propaganda. Absolutely. And Goebbels, who ran the Ministry of Propaganda, was very, very close to, to Hitler. That's right. Uh, and without that office doing what it was doing to open the door to predispose people to accepting views and ideas that they might otherwise not have, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have gotten where they were. And so today you see the vast majority of the media being used and going along with being the propaganda arm of the liberal progressives today. And that is a huge problem. Scary. It, it is very scary. So to, um, to achieve uh, the vision, here's what they have to attack. And it's basically us. The family, mm -hmm. parental authority and responsibility. The state needs to decide how you should raise your kids. Oh, wow. State sovereignty, U.S. sovereignty. They want us to, the United States, to be subservient to United Nations right. laws and rules. Scary. Okay? Um, respect for life. Obviously, we know what that's all about here and how, how entrenched, entrenched the progressives are in the rights to abortion, not the right to choose. I don't see much choice going on in their organization. It's, it's a right to kill your baby at any time, for any reason, anywhere you want. Right. And they don't move from that position. Okay. Right to lifers, unfortunately, kind of move around on this sometimes, and we'll talk about that. Capitalism, the Catholic Church. Catholic Church is anathema to these folks, to progressives, for all the reasons we've already talked about. All other Christian churches, again, who believe in the truth. The Constitution of the United States, traditional morals. They want to exercise, and in fact do, exercise great influence over schools, the media, and unions. Right. They are also their political vehicles to get, their, get the vote out and to, to elect candidates that support their views. But here's the obstacles they face. They face an informed and an increasingly better informed and educated public. Yes. That's, that's, that's this group right here and, and groups like ours all around. <laughs> economic policies that don't work, okay? Right. Their economic policies simply have never borne productive results, ever. Absolutely. Ever. And so you can sell it to people, you can push it for a few years, but eventually it's going to fall under its own weight. Of, of, um, of, of being just a bad theory of economics, the government controlling everything you spend and being the solution to all economic ills. Um, it just, it's just not going to work. Um, growing acceptance of pro-life views, and everybody in this room knows that the polls are more in our favor than they have probably ever been. Uh, we've got to keep that ball rolling, and, 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 and particularly the young people in this, in this room need to make sure that you don't let that change as you get to your 20s and 30s. Uh, when the rest of us are, are uh, long gone or no longer will be able to function the way we would like to. Right. Amen. Um, the rule of law speaks for itself. The Catholic Church and all Christian churches, strict constitutionalists, public reaction to generally failed policies of the progressives. But the thing I think that they, that they, the biggest obstacle they face is something that will never change, 
and that is the truth. We yes. have the truth on our side. Gallup had a great uh, survey done in 2013 at the end of the year, and the question was asked, you know, what's the biggest problem that we face in this country here? And a lot of people, progressives would tell you it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, big companies, it's Wall Street, it's the banks, it's, you know, and everybody has some contribution to those problems, certainly. But 72% believe big government is a bigger problem than, than big business or big labor, certainly. Uh, and that was in 2013. I suspect a more recent poll would show that number to be even, uh, even higher. Just going to talk briefly about the faces here because I'm not here to espouse political candidacy and so on, but right. let's face it, if you go by the descriptions of how I describe policies and so on, you know, our current president is a progressive, okay? He's yes, progressive sir. and liberal, whatever you want to, however you want to, you know, put the title on here. He's espousing progressive and liberal policies, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Hillary Clinton is no different. In fact, she has, we know a she's lot a, about her. Worse. We know a lot about her ties to uh, Alinsky. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, while she is more politically adept than the current president at, at moving to the center when it's convenient, uh, at the baseline, they're both the same. That's right. and, and don't let anybody tell you that they're very it different. It could be two different faces, two different names. Whoever runs for president in the future, we have to be discriminating and we have to be educated on what these differences are and what these people believe in as we talk to our friends, neighbors, and relatives. Uh, about what choices to make uh, from a political standpoint. Okay. Some more good news, and I want to make sure that we, 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 uh, we sort of go down this path of it's not all so bad. We have a lot of good things going for us, not the least of which, as I mentioned, is the truth. Um, we know who they are. Because we're more educated and because we have some news outlets that are at least keeping, keeping tabs on where things are going, we know who they are. We know what they're working on. They're no longer subterranean behind the scenes. We know where they, where the, where the progressives are, and what they're trying to do with their agenda to destroy our agenda of uh, pro-life and family. We know where their money comes from. Definitely. We know they own most of the media. We already know that, and we understand their tactics and are getting better at continuing to understand what their tactics are. So they're really out in the open, and I really think that's good news. Yes, sir. Okay, when your enemy is working guerrilla style, right. and you don't know where they are, you don't know anything about them, you, they can show up anywhere, that's hard to fight. We know who they are, we know where they are, we know what they're doing and what they believe in, and that gives us a much better chance of, of, of winning. Taking them out. Mm -hmm. um, we need to use the media better. You know, our groups that, not just pro-life groups, but groups that are conservative and so on, that are probably cousins, good first cousins of ours, uh, are not as adept at using the media as the progressives are. We're disadvantaged in a, in a way because we won't lie, we won't misrepresent, we won't start rumors, we won't attack individual people uh, in their backgrounds, in their faith, and what they believe in, and so on. Um, we have, we're limited by the truth. But while it's a limiting factor at the same time, it's also our biggest advantage, and we have to think about it that way. Our organization, all of our organizations have to tactically adapt. We cannot fight the pro-life issue, in my opinion, or the family issue, the way we did in 1975. Amen. Or 1985, for that matter. We have different things now. Not only have circumstances changed, we have different media. We have social media, okay, uh, that the other side uses to get out the vote to support their issues, okay? We have to do better at coordinating amongst the groups that are like-minded to try to convey a more consistent and a more comprehensive message out to everybody here. Um, things like online petitions, those are, those are coming across the internet constantly. Uh, and we need to take the time to sit down and, and fill those out and get sign our name to things that go to the politicians that will influence policy decisions. Okay. Um, political endorsements. Now, a lot of our organizations are 501c3s, and so we don't do endorsements, but we certainly can influence educationally voters. And for those that do have C4s and, or PACs, there's, there's things you can do. And I'm here to tell you that we need to be more discriminating in how we support politicians. 
I get told, I've been around this whole state with Molly, we've met with all the politicians, all this, you know, all of the senior officials in this in this town, in this state, and we have told them that it's not enough that you are pro-life according to some standards set by some organizations. If you believe in exceptions, if you believe you can pick winners and losers in the life war, and you're okay with exceptions for rape and incest, don't tell us that you are pro-life. I don't believe that you are. You either are for protecting all life or not. You're not in the business of selecting where those exceptions might be. And a lot of politicians don't like to be put in that corner. Yeah, right. But Cleveland Right to Life, I won't speak for everybody in the state, but we're no longer going to accept that, and we're not going to support candidates that don't support life, period. And because... Right! There you go! Seems like our side always incrementally gives up a little <laughs> something to get something. The right. other side, they could find that there's an abortionist in Philadelphia killing babies and ultimately convicted. Do you think that would cause them to make a statement and, and, and give up some ground? Did the National no, Organization of Women? Never. None of them. None of them gave up any ground, even though they probably had some good reason. Mm -hmm. But they won't give they an didn't. inch. We in pro-life sometimes are willing to give away feet, not inches. And we have to stop doing that. Otherwise, we are not going to win the battle that we're in. That's right. What I call meaningless incremental gains. You know, uh, it, it just doesn't it just doesn't make sense. So we've got to fight life with new tactics and fight for life with new tactics. And if we don't, we'll get the same results we've been getting over this time here. So let me kind of wrap things up here. I don't know how I'm doing on five minutes. Good. Not too far off. Um, so the real issue for us is about defending life and the family. The two are inexorably linked together. This is why Cleveland Right to Life and several groups around the state and others around the country are now tying in dealing with politicians, we're, we're tying traditional marriage support with the pro-life support because you can't separate the family, the traditional family, the marriage as God has deigned it for 5,000 years to suddenly get redefined. You can't tell me you're pro-life if you're willing to destroy the family in this country. It, the two just can't Absolutely. go together. Absolutely. Somebody smoke this um, We're the ones who can and will stop it. Modern liberalism, progressivism, is destructive. It repudiates the existence of God and wishes citizens to be subservient to the state. They are not seeking the truth, and that is why, ultimately, they will not succeed. Thank you very much for your time and attention. And I'd be willing to take a few questions, if anybody, questions or comments. Yes, ma'am.